Hi everyone, happy Sunday. It's Elisa here and I'm very excited to be with you once again for our Sunday Investor Global Online Fireside Chat. Today we're broadcasting out of a very early but magical Silicon Valley once again. I can't get over the magic of this pulsating heart of global entrepreneurship. As always, the community remains at the forefront of my trip and from what I can see, some amazing things are on our path ahead. Once again, today we have an exceptional session planned for you. During our time with our superstar panelists, we're going to be discussing the ins and outs of investing in global startups. What should you know? This is a topic that has a lot of relevance for our truly global community of startups and investors. So you definitely want to sit back, relax and start learning today. Now I've got you all excited. Let me go, go ahead and, and introduce you to our VIP guests before asking them to properly introduce themselves to you. Welcome to Georgia, USA-based Monica McCoy, who's a global speaker, strategist, and executive coach. Welcome to Missouri, USA-based Josh Kimberg, who's a business builder, community developer, entrepreneur, and marketer. Welcome to New York, USA-based Michael Kapalikov, who's a serial entrepreneur, blockchain, health, and, uh, ICO, and health tech specialist. Welcome to Berkshire, UK-based Christoph Farrell, who's a management consultant, strategist, entrepreneur and accountant and welcome to london uk based graham davies who is a cfo angel investor corporate finance professional and consultant now you want to learn from the best and they're here so let me ask our vips to introduce themselves to starting with monica monica please go ahead and introduce yourself good day everyone thank you so much alicia my name is monica mccoy and i am a global speaker executive coach and business strategist i enjoy working with startups i just recently left my corporate job as a global director where i hosted um, startup weekends and hackathons and i'm now um, in the process of still coaching small business owners to help them set themselves up in the best position to secure funding so very excited to be here with you guys today and looking forward to a great call Thank you, Monica. Very, very excited to have someone such as yourself joining us today. Looking forward to learning from a global thought leader like such as yourself. So thank you. Josh, please say hi to everyone from Canvas. Hey, how's it going, everyone? This is Josh Kimbro. Uh, my back, a little bit about my background. I've been an uh, entrepreneur ever since I was 16. I uh, got Kiwi from the city for uh, minority and inclusion innovations. Uh, uh, right now, we're working on some uh, innovative accelerator projects. We've been helping out a lot of entrepreneurs uh, try to reach global milestones in the area. So that's what we've been doing. Um, thanks. I uh, just want to say it's a pleasure to meet everybody today, and I'm very humbled by the experience. Josh, we're very excited to have you join us as a fellow champion of diversity. I think you're doing incredible work, so we look forward to learning from you today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Michael, please say hi to everyone. Uh uh, hello, my name is Michael Kaplikov. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, my background, have background in finance, technology, and uh, research. And over the last couple of years, I've been working on my own uh, startups. Actually, we have a holding company. And, uh, within this holding company, we have a couple of uh, projects. All of them have either blockchain or artificial intelligence uh, tech or both of those technologies. And now a couple of our projects, we're getting ready for an ICO. Very, very excited to have you join us. Uh, looking forward to you sharing both the European and American perspectives. So thank you, Michael. Christoph, please say hi from the UK. Good, good day, everybody. I'm Christoph Farrell. Um, I've been involved in uh, uh, research and development strategy and developing uh, businesses from startup to large multinationals uh, for uh, 30 years, uh, specializing in the health tech sports technology, clean technology industries, and, um, and I've set up my own consultancy now that uh, it's quite comprehensive what it does. So I'm looking forward to that and um, thank you very much for having me today. Welcome, very excited to have you uh, join us, Christoph. Looking forward to hearing your insights. And last but definitely not least, Graham, who's from the UK, who's in a very early San Francisco this morning. Graham, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thanks, Alicia. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, so my background is corporate finance and M&A um, for, for large corporates. 
And about 18 months ago, I decided to set up my own company using my, using my experience and skills to support startups um, effectively get, get investor ready and help them raise money and help, help them on their journey to being successful. So I um, started that 18 months ago. Now I've got a, quite a few CFO assignments, supported quite a few companies, raise money. So still, still on my journey of understanding this space. Um, and yeah, all going well. I'm really enjoying being in San Francisco and, and learning about the, the ecosystem here, which is very interesting. Thank you, Graham. And a little secret to share with our, our whole community. If you want the inside scoop on the coolest restaurants in London around the globe, there's not a Michelin star chef in the world that doesn't want to be friends with Graham because he's so good at what he does. So <laughs> Graham's the guy to talk to if you like good food, everybody. So <laughs> just before we jump into our questions, a few shout outs. On the screen are contact details for all our VIPs. Feel free to reach out to them. I know they love to hear from you. You can keep sending your questions through to inspire me at onlinefiresidechat.com. We'll do our very best to include them. We know we have many, many, many of you joining us today, so we will do our best to have your questions uh, directed to our VIPs. But don't worry, if they don't get directed, we will invite these VIPs back again. So no matter what happens, you will grow and learn. Just a reminder, we have community champions and ever-growing meetup groups in 80 cities and over 60 countries countries around the globe, including in North and South America, the UK, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, India, Asia, and Australia. If you'd like to meet up with your local chapter, you'd like, like to start your own, feel free to reach out to us via email. We'll do our best to make sure you can meet your local community champion. On that note, and I know I can't say this enough times, but thank you to our volunteer community champions from around the globe. You're the heart and soul of our community, and we would not be here today without you. Over the next few months, and with all your help, our aim is to empower and inspire entrepreneurs in more than 100 countries. We know that together we can make this happen. Thank you to our extraordinary VIP guests for sharing your knowledge and wisdom so freely with us today. We're incredibly appreciative that you're joining us. Thanks to our growing family of supporters and collaborators from around the developing world. Or once again, hosting sessions for hundreds of entrepreneurs who don't have access to the necessary bandwidth or understanding of the English language to join our sessions on their own. Thank you all to, to all the presidents, prime ministers, ambassadors, government ministries, UN offices, US Embassy Corners, World Economic Forum, British Council offices, university campuses, schools, business incubators, chamber of commerce, and community centers, and radio stations for all the ongoing weekly hosting support and for raising awareness in your regions and communities. Thank you to everyone from our UN Women team for all your support as well. Once again, we stream across new live platforms today. Thank you to all our community members for all you do for our community. On that note, we are going to the UN in two weeks' time. So if you want to come meet us at the General Assembly, some of our best startups in the ecosystem doing game-changing stuff when it comes to solving the world's biggest challenges, we'll be presenting. So make sure to stay in contact. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, you want to learn from the best, and they are here to teach you. Our topic for today, the ins and outs of investing in global startups. What should you know? So we're going to tell our VIPs how this works. We want them to be extra comfortable. VIPs, we're going to pose a question to one of you, but it goes to all of you. Feel free to share your insights. No answer is wrong. We are here to learn from you, and we're very excited that you're joining us. So who should we put on the hot seat first? Let's see who's, who deserves <laughs> to start this session off today. Uh, Monica. Yes. Monica, you have had extraordinary business experience. It's some, you know, one of the world's biggest brands, and now you've moved into the startup world. And um, we would love to know from you, are there, based on your experience, some great investing opportunities around the globe rather than purely in the U.S.? Yes. Yeah, so um, thanks for that great question. And what I would say is that I – really enjoyed my 15 years experience um, with one of the number one brands um, in, the, in the world and I enjoyed actually having the global footprint. And one of the things that I would say that was very, um, very interesting is that my company at the time that I worked for had an innovation entrepreneurship organization. And when bringing these, these um, startups in from around the globe, one of the consistent trends that I saw was that individuals either were not able to clearly articulate their MVP or they were not able to clearly articulate their financials. So I saw there was a huge gap um, that a lot of these startups were having and I decided to go ahead and start coaching them on my own on the side. 
and now, you know, really saying that, you know, there's a way for you to come and be able to more clearly articulate your pitch so that even if you're pitching in the U.S., Australia, India, et cetera, that you're able to make sure that no matter who is your, your target investor, that you're able to clearly articulate and secure that funding. Absolutely brilliant insight starting today's session off. And it's, it's quite ironic that you say um, entrepreneurs couldn't um, vocalize the MVP because that is exactly how our community started. We had an extraordinary entrepreneur here in the US who's done extremely well. She was our first VIP guest ever. And she said what she noticed around the globe, just the same as you, is that entrepreneurs find it extremely difficult to actually explain the MVP and deal with their financials. So thank you, Monica. Graham, I know you, you've played in both the startup world and you have access to some of the top investors in the UK. Do you want to add anything in terms of what Monica was saying? Uh, yeah, I, I, I firstly just say that, you know, there definitely are good opportunities outside of the US. Um, there's definitely good opportunities in London, which is what I can see. Um, but what I will say from, from being here uh, in the US is that I think because the US is more experienced in investing in this kind of space, the venture capital space, everything's a bit more professionalized and there's a bit more of a formula for things over here. Um, and I think that's why you end up seeing more success come out of the US because there's, there's just a stronger ecosystem. Um, so I, I think what, what we need to do, I'm really keen to do this, is try and develop the ecosystem you know, in the UK and the rest of Europe and everywhere else in the world really and try and take what we can from the US formula uh, and apply it to other parts of the world because there are good ideas out there it's just getting them in the right space. So, the right so thank you, Gray. And I'm going to jump on in here and ask you a question from the community straight away. It goes to both you and to Christoph, but to our panel as a whole. Graham, in summary, what are the biggest differences between raising funding for a startup in the UK versus, based on your experience, raising it here in the US? Could you summarize it? Um, yeah, so the differences are the, the investor's appetite for risk. So in the UK, um, investors look at companies um, on an individual basis and kind of rather, rather than accepting the risk of investing in startups, they try to go for a startup which has no risk, which is impossible. Whereas in the US, they, they're way more accepting of the risk involved. Fascinating insights. Thank you, Graham. Christoph, do you want to add anything here in terms of the entrepreneurs looking to come to the UK and based on your experience in terms of building businesses there? I, I have to totally agree with Graham that the risk uh, appetite um, within the UK is, uh, is a lot lower than in the United States. Uh, that has been my experience. And uh, so it, it, that's more of a reserve um, cynical sometimes approach towards inventions so uh, this is this is evolving uh, culture is always changing so we are seeing a, a movement coming along it's becoming more and more professional i believe uh, in the uk and uh, there are new generation of people with greater risk appetite coming through um so in with the new and slowly out with the old, I, and uh, it will evolve, and we'll see some parity. And I've experienced that in uh, China, India, uh, that uh, there is this uh, growing risk appetite. So I think we'll we will see that movement reaching a parity in a relatively short period of time. Thank you, Christoph. Most interesting insights. Now, moving on to our next question. Um, Michael, I know you're a European entrepreneur based here in the US as well. Again, touching on what your co-panelists were talking about, you're up to some very, very interesting stuff. We would love to hear your perspective in terms of building a startup in Europe. Um, I know Spain has become one of the global entrepreneurship hubs as far as Europe goes, and you're based in New York. Very exciting. Lots of cool stuff happening on the entrepreneurship front. Please share your perspectives and insights in terms of entrepreneurs, startups entering your various markets. As I say, you are an immigrant here to the US, and there must be some challenges involved in terms of getting investments and building your business. Could you please share some insights with us? Um Sure, I just spent one year in Spain at IE Business School, and I will have to probably agree with what other panelists have mentioned before. Overall, I think it's not just the UK, but 
you know, European market overall is, um, you know, they have a you know, small propensity for risk taking. They prefer startups um, that, you know, they consider to be not so risky, which is, you know, it's hard to find. And I think uh, also what happens, they, uh, because of this, they tend to invest less into complicated projects, into high-tech projects. And that's why you have so few, you know, really big startups that come out from Europe. Most of the unicorns, uh, they are American-based. And uh, in terms, you know, in terms of the U.S. market, I mean, I, you know, of course, you are always, you know, facing challenges and especially if you're not native to the country, probably you're facing more challenges than if you are native. But I think overall, uh, you know, American startup ecosystem is pretty open to people from around the world. So I think if you want to take a chance, if you want to come to the U.S. and start your own business, I think, you know, you have a real shot. It's fascinating. You see, you said that, Michael. I watched a fascinating documentary last night in terms of Mexicans, um, illegal immigrants coming to the U.S., and that was what was touched on, that the U.S. is open for business. It doesn't matter where you come from. There are many, many opportunities. So I think we all feel the same way, that even if you are from overseas and that it does give you the greatest chance of success possible. But then you have to look at the emerging markets and around the globe and you see huge opportunities. So startups are the future and entrepreneurship is the future. And it's very exciting. The future that awaits all of us. And Josh, on that note, I know you guys are up to some really interesting stuff in Kansas and you are trying to become one of the hubs, hubs of startup uh, ecosystems here in the US. Do you want to touch on it? Share your insights with us, what you guys are up to what's working, what's not working, um, your, your, your plans for the future in terms of making Kansas the next Silicon Valley? Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, I think that's one of the challenges for uh, not just uh, not just people around the world, but people for, from um, ecosystems that don't, that haven't adapted that innovative uh, um, type of uh, type of mindset yet. So so the challenge is actually creating that whole innovative ecosystem within your wherever you're located at to um, kind of get people um, comfortable with taking these risks and uh, and getting new people in the environment, getting more diversity in there. I think that's the biggest issue. We have a couple people that actually came from other countries and uh, created created. Um, um, excellent uh, giant businesses, and what they did was uh, they they kept the lines of communication open. They reached out, um, and they they were able to um, um, communicate on the type of platforms that uh, we like to communicate on. So that's one of the things that I think is uh, uh, super important is understanding uh, that ecosystem that you're in and how to communicate with uh, people. You got to go where the market's at. So. Um, like you said, getting people inside, the, uh, getting new talent, getting new faces inside uh, the U.S. and uh, uh, getting those warm introductions. So, Josh, I'm going to jump right in, Josh, because I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs and ecosystem builders and, that, and governments listening right now, learning from your, your, your example of what it takes to build a city startup ecosystem. And that. What were the most info important factors that you knew had to be addressed in order to get this right in Kansas? Please share any insights you can. I think the biggest thing that actually is uh, starting to get uh, – Kansas City, um, really changing that environment is really um, a education and uh, and b getting that uh, media in place because uh, one one thing one of the things that we noticed that we wasn't having a lot of outgoing media and people just didn't know about what we were doing. So I think just getting that information out there and having those lines of communication open is huge. And we're going to keep coming back to Josh because I know there are many, many people from all big organizations, presidents that are listening today who would like your insights and what has or hasn't worked. So we're going to come back to you again. This next question is for Monica. Monica, once again, you've, you've learned so much across the course of your career. What principles do you believe we as startups could use to increase our chances of success in terms of building our businesses? 
Yeah, I, that's a great question. And one of the things that I would say is, first of all, really understanding what is your current runway and burn rate. So many entrepreneurs come in asking for a certain amount of funding, but then there, uh, you know, I pose the question, well, how long is that going to really last for you? Is that just going to get you through the next month? Is this going to help you for the next year? But really making sure that you really understand both, you know, what you need for the short term and long term. And then also, you know, being comfortable with pivoting. I um, work with so many entrepreneurs who really get sort of stuck and not really understanding that it's okay to pivot. You don't have to, you know, just stay frustrated, you know, in one part of the, 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 the journey, but you go ahead and, and pivot if, if something's not working. And then finally, I would say just one of my, my other key learnings is to really understand, you know, do you have a, a, a clear board of advisors? So it's one thing to have the, the clear team of core team members, but also who are those clear advisors that you're bringing in that can really help to, um, to help you work through some of the challenges much quicker. So almost if you would say a board of directors um, for the startup who are just informal volunteers helping to give advice. Thank you once again, Monica, some fantastic insights being shared. And again, I think this is one of the things I learned in my journey living here in the U.S. is that you have so much clarity in terms of what entrepreneurs need to do to succeed. You've talked about burn rate. You've talked about pivoting. You've talked about board of advisors. Each one of these things is critical to success. Again, uh, Michael, I would love to hear your insights in terms of everything that Monica has been saying because she's added so much value to the session in terms of increasing our chances of success as entrepreneurs. Michael, please share your insights. Um, sure. Well, um, again, I would agree with what Monica has said, but you have to look at the market. You have to look at the market fit. You have to look at your resources. You know, you have to, you know, you have to see if, you know, if you're, you have to validate your idea because sometimes, you know, we come up with an idea and we fall so much in love with our idea, but it's, you know, but maybe no one else is interested in it. So you have to talk to people, you have to send out service, you have to you know, try to talk to as many people as you can to make sure that there's actual demand for your solution, for your product. And I think that would be the first step. Once you have validated it, then you know, the next step would be to look at your resources. What, what, what resources you have to build your product, your company, and what resources you need. And those resources could be material or they could be intangible resources like, you know, uh, advisory board, connections, introductions, etc. So I think those probably are the couple of most important steps when you're trying to set up your startup. Thank you so much, Michael. Some fantastic insights being shared by you too. Um, we're going back to you, Monica. Um, one of your co-panelists actually had a very interesting question. Josh would like to know, and I think our entire community, myself included, would like to know, your perspective in terms of board of advisors, both advising the startup side, and then we as investors in that, we'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of taking a board position, um, yeah, I know a lot of issues for a lot of investors and entrepreneurs is that they feel um, the remuneration is either unfair or not fair or how much value is the right amount of value to be added. And then please, Monica, share your insights, what has or hasn't worked as you've, as you've watched all these startups grow. Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically, it's diversity of thoughts um, within the startup um, team members. So a lot of times you'll have individuals who everyone is good at strategy, but then there's like not a team member who can really do the sound back building with the automation part of and, and building out the IT skills that are needed um, to really have um, the 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 MVP go as far as possible. So really finding those complementary skills that are really huge gaps um, within the team are really key. And there are many individuals who um, are raising their hands to volunteer and join some of these boards out of true passion for the space, or also just because this is you know, really helping them from an innovative perspective to be able to take some of these key learnings back to their organizations. From an investor um, perspective, you know, as you are, are really looking at, you know, potentially um, companies that um, and startups you want to potentially partner with, it's really clear that it's really very um, 
intentional that you spend effort and really looking at what are some of the gaps that are existing? So if you see that this, this um, startup has a great concept, but they don't have anyone who understands their P&L, they don't understand the valuation process, you know, really, you know, either partnering to say, okay, I can connect you with someone to really help you, or I want to serve as that role because I see the potential here and I, and your valuation is completely off track, but I want to, um, to go ahead and, and help you there. So there's a specific organization here in Atlanta called Digital Undivided that I volunteer at. And basically we bring in resources from all across the United States um, to help fill in some of these gaps um, that some of these um, startups may have when it comes to their, their founders. So I can go into a lot more detail and this could spend a whole hour talking about this, but definitely um, a very huge passion point for me. Thank you, Monica. And I'm going to come back to you again. We've had three community questions on different topics, but a lot of entrepreneurs have questions for you. So I'm going to come back to you already on the same thing. So just bear with us, everybody. I know everyone wants to know how we actually successfully built these boards of advisors. It seems to be a global problem. So Monica, we'll be back. Graham, please okay. share your insights. Um, yeah, I mean, I de definitely agree with what Monica was saying. I, I think I'd, I'd add that actually, I think the most successful companies probably have the the best board of advisors. Um, and I see lots of companies that go out there and, and kind of just try and find very successful people to sit on their board and be their board of directors, which isn't always the best thing. You, you, you need people with the right skills. So you need someone who, who knows your industry, who, who's done this sort of thing before. So it's really important you pick the right people rather than just successful people. Um, although they can add a lot of value, I think having people with the industry expertise really, you know, helps you along the way. Someone who can really open doors for you, which I think is really important. You've touched on something very interesting, Graham, in the sense that I think a lot of entrepreneurs um, are, to, to be fair, I've been there as well. You see famous people, you see high profile people, um, they're passionate about what you do. You feel, wow, this is such a huge opportunity. I want this person on my advisory board because they can bring in customers or their reputation can help me hack the system and move the business faster. Have you got any insights to share in terms of mistakes you've seen entrepreneurs make in this regard or successful successful case studies where entrepreneurs did collaborate with high profile um, investors or thought leaders and where they ultimately helped speed up the growth of the business any thoughts you'd like to share there graham um i'm just trying to think of a specific example of this um and i think i mean one of one of the projects i'm currently working on which is um we're getting a lot of traction and being extremely successful which is which is in a healthcare company um, our board of directors, we've been very careful in who we select and we've, we've selected only people that are very influential in the space, that are very well connected. Um, and that, that really has made us go from being a, you know, just a kind of average startup to a, a business which with huge revenue potential. So that's, I mean, it's all about getting people that can open doors for you, I think. I think that's the most important thing. And that was a UK-based startup, if I'm not mistaken, Graham, and it seems to be getting a lot of attention here in Silicon Valley, if I'm not mistaken. So you clearly are doing things right. Guys, if you want to reach out to Graham and ask him how he's doing that, it's very impressive. So, Christoph, we'd love to hear your perspective in terms of what Monica was saying and what Graham was saying. Please go ahead. Yeah, well, on regarding the, I totally agree about the necessity of a, a board of directors. Uh, I'd uh, add on to that uh, something that, Manages the board, which is the company secretary, uh, that is necessary to uh, ensure that the board of directors are moving in the right direction and that they are practicing good governance. Uh, I don't see um, that that is also necessary for a startup. Um, building processes, I would add, the startup needs to begin to start developing processes in everything it's doing continuously uh, improve on its processes uh, because otherwise it becomes too freewheeling um, and you end up in sort of chaotic uh, uh, movement and uh, so I think building processes are, are very important uh, for success um, and uh, protecting you know protection of ideas uh, is very important but I think another important factor about uh, success is, is recognizing that your marketing and brand building begins at the same time as your product development 
And if you recognize that, then you, rather than it becoming some sort of an afterthought, you are building the credibility and authority at the time of creation and you become attached to the market much sooner that you're building the product that you are wanting to launch. Never you end up. And on day one, you will have already had a key opinion leader, base, uh, authority uh, to actually launch that product. Thank you, Christoph. I'm so sorry, everybody. We seem to have difficulty hearing Christoph. Um, okay. Christoph, we are trying to hear you. If you could just keep speaking up so that we can hear you. Um, Josh, I know uh, you've had some experience in terms of the startup ecosystem. Around what your co-panelists were saying, we would love to hear from you, and this goes to your co-panelists as well. Can you talk a bit about the funding climate in Kansas in terms of building startups and raising funding in that versus in your sister, in your sister cities, New York and Silicon Valley? Most definitely. So we're just trying to uh, um, we're just trying to continue to grow, uh, keep growth keep growth for uh, the Kansas City market. And the funding climate in Kansas City has been uh, been kind of uh, congruent to the uh, New York and uh, Silicon Valley in, in a such that we've been really focused on technology. And uh, um, what's really novel about um, your startup or your product and identifying those specific uh, um, qualities that really um, kind of keep competition out and keep you ahead of the uh, ahead of the race. So uh, I think one of the big things that, uh, as he was mentioning, is um, processes and identifying those processes. That could be that your your novel um, your novel uh, shift that allows you to uh, really take advantage of uh, the market. And if you have a more more crisp, more streamlined process, then um, then uh, more people are going to want to be attracted to your model. Thank you. Very, very interesting insights being shared there, Josh. And um, we'd love to hear from Monica. Can you talk more about the funding climate in the U.S., your opinion, um, filling in the holes to successfully raising funding, any successful startup case studies you've heard of outside of Silicon Valley that are raising large sums of funding, anything interesting you'd like to share? Of course, it goes to your co-panelists as well. And then, Michael, we would love to hear from you um, about ICOs and are they being disrupted? Are they disrupting the venture capital space? So Monica, please go for it. Absolutely. So I'll tell you that one of the successful models that I have seen recently are startups who are really um, partnering with larger corporations to get into their innovation entrepreneurship program. So there's a program called The Bridge right now that brings in startups and helps them um, use their, their MVP or their, their concept to help solve um, bigger problems for corporations. And what I've seen here is that there, there are pros and cons to it. The pros are that um, you're able to partner with a larger corporation and, and secure um, funding in a more strategic um, format. But also one of the, the cons that I've seen to it is that sometimes you lose that um, that um, where you, you had this original vision for where the company was going and you sort of have to pivot to a different direction um, to, to keep going with um, this particular platform. So that is the model that I've um, seen recently and I am always very, um, very cognizant to tell the startups that, you know, there are definitely pros and cons to this particular partnership, but if you're strictly looking to build your scalability and increase your funding, then this may be something that you want to look at pursuing. So you've touched on something very interesting again, Monica, and I was actually speaking in China at the World Forum on Foreign Direct Investment, and there were a lot of venture capitalists and investors there, and I was asked this question, if you have the opportunity, would you partner with a big organization or would you take venture capital funding? And I'm proud to say that um, both Darren and I partnered um, on one of our businesses with, take, with big organizations and they looked after us. They helped us build our technology. It was a very good experience. And um, as you say, there are pros and cons, but for a lot of startups, this is the most successful, protective way of, of actually building your business. And um, we would love for you, Monica, when we ask you again, if there are any organizations, um, aside from the ones you mentioned, that our entrepreneurs should look into in terms of um, collaborating with them in terms of the benefits, um, you know, from a financial, from co-working space perspective, you know, from uh, protecting the IP. Any insights you can share in terms of this, Monica, we'd love for you to share during the session. Josh, um, 
you are in this space. Um, would you like to share your insights in terms of startups partnering with organizations? I was based in uh, Durham in the Research Triangle at one point in my life, and I know there were some amazing benefits being offered to come and being based there. And we'd love to hear from you. What what does Kansas do to help startups succeed and partner, help them partner with global brands? And love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, most definitely. Um, actually, we have a unique model in Kansas City where uh, a good associate of mine, Ezzy as he, uh, Redwood, what he does is uh, it's called Rise Fast, and he actually helps uh, create those entrepreneurship uh, ecosystems on corporations. So, um, so he helps uh, employees actually uh, get, get um, accelerated faster and in, in drawing the innovation out of those particular employees. So he works from kind of like the inverse side of it. So uh, that's pr pretty unique um, model that he has going on. And then other than that, what we do is uh, a Sprint Accelerator has, uh, has uh, a lot of uh, uh, ties. And what they do is uh, they uh, help, help build entrepreneurs and help, uh, help connect those uh, organizations to within the community. So, um, so those those uh, programs that I just mentioned, some of the some of the unique ways that uh, Kansas City specifically helps tie uh, to those organizations. Thank you so much, Josh. I'm going to throw this one quickly back at Monica, and then I know Graham's got some insights. Monica, if for example we have some very big banks and um, corporates in that based out of Africa looking to build um, accelerator programs in that in order to start building their startup ecosystems and they're starting to some extent from a base of scratch um, what insights would you feel are the most important things for them to know in order to be successful partners in startup ecosystems help governments succeed please share Monica Absolutely. So first, I would say to really understand the value that you bring. able to make decisions more much more quickly than a traditional um, huge fortune 100 fortune 500 company and a lot of these organizations are looking for that agility that speed to the marketplace that speed to getting decisions made very quickly and being able to get get out to their consumers so if they can um, if they can truly get to a point of being able to really articulate their value and not try to reinvent the wheel, but instead to go ahead and partner strategically with these organizations, they'll see that they can gain so much from taking themselves from more of an infancy model to more of getting into an ecosystem that is much more mature and well-developed. Thank you, Monica. We actually have a session coming up in terms of accelerators, what works, what doesn't work. We've got some very, some of the top accelerator programs here in Silicon Valley joining us. We definitely want you to have a, have you join us as well because you've seen and done it all, clearly. Graham, we would love to hear your insights in terms of what Monica was saying, and then Michael, please go ahead. Sure. Um, I'll just reiterate that it's important of strategic partnerships like Monica and Heavily Us has been saying. Uh, and what and a specific example from my point of view is that um, one of the companies that I've been working with, and uh, one of one of my uh, one of my partners is a is a law firm, uh, and it's this law firm has a huge Commonwealth network, um, and by by developing a strategic partnership with the startup and this law firm, we've managed to make connections around the Commonwealth and really help them grow. So I think it's really important you get the right partnerships, and corporates can help you do the same. Uh, they also can help you develop your product. Um, with, without you kind of having to worry about finding the cash or, you know, it, it basically gives you a bit of a leg up, uh, which I think is really important. But it also puts you in a, in a really great position then to go out and secure funding. So uh, it's kind of like, you know, if you, go and, if you go and raise money and you can prove that people are interested in supporting you with this and they're big corporations or they're professional services firms or whatever it is, I think that puts you in a stronger position. Um, and to, to go back to the point before where you said, you know, what what makes a successful um, fundraising process? I think it's absolutely that having the right support network around you, which will help you then secure your lead investor. And I think once you've got your lead investor, 
um, topping up the round with smaller smaller investors is, is is easy. I mean, people like to follow a lead investor, especially if you've got a, a, a decent venture capital fund as your lead investor. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. You've touched on some fascinating insights. And um, having seen some uh, some of the entrepreneurs coming out of Y Combinator's demo day this week and being party to a lot of these conversations, I think what you have touched on is so critically important because startups are limited when it comes to the amount of money they have available. I think that's a global problem. And the idea that you can have law firms as partners, you can have companies such as Silicon Valley Bank as partners, they can help you save money and they can help you do things right from the get-go. I'm the first to admit I've burned through more money than I care to know about in all the wrong directions when it comes to collaborating with law firms, not knowing what I'm doing, the wrong partnership. So everything you guys are touching on today, I hope our entrepreneurs are listening, taking notes because these things can ultimately help you on the long run, do things right, and make sure your business is set up for success. So thank you for sharing those insights, Graham. Absolutely brilliant. Now, talking about funding, I know this is a hot topic, um, very, very polarized views in this. Uh, Michael, we're going to put you on the hot seat. We are all fascinated to know about the ICO funding model, what you are doing, what is working, is venture capital ripe for disruption? Now's the time to share all, and then I want our co-panelists uh, to share their insights as well in terms of this opportunity. Michael, please go for it. Let's hear all about it. Well, sure. And I show is a relatively recent development. I'll just you know, very briefly explain what it is for people who may not be familiar with it. It's like an IPO, but it's in it's instead of initial public offering, it's initial coin offering. And this is a new opportunity for startups to raise money. And so it's also an opportunity to bypass you know angel investors, venture capitalists in in, in a way it's it's a kind of like a crowdsourcing campaign. Uh, uh, however, it's only open for startups that um, use blockchain technology. I mean, there's some, I think, exceptions. Uh, there have been some ICOs maybe for the startups that don't necessarily have uh, the blockchain technology, but mostly it's for the blockchain uh, startups. Um, and you know it's an, it's an exciting development. It's it's not necessarily easier than raising money through VCs or angel investors, but it's different. I think it gives you more control and gives you you know direct access to your potential investors. Uh, whether it's whether VCs are going to be disrupted by this uh, latest trend, you know, I'm not sure. I think there's enough room for everyone, and also. Uh, some of the biggest investors into ICOs are um, hedge funds and private equity f firms. And I haven't heard about VCs investing into ICOs, but maybe secretly they do. I'm not sure. And uh, uh, yeah, I think it's very exciting. I also, I think there's some problems with it. I think there have been too many ICOs. And I think to a lot of people in the industry, it starts looking like a dot-com bubble. Uh, you know, every day you hear about startups raising ridiculous amounts of money without any real product in place, without uh, without revenues, without even like a solid team or solid business model. But, you know, on the other hand, I'm sure some of those startups are going to survive and probably, you know, three years from now, five years from now, you know, they're going to become huge like Google or Facebook. So thank you, Michael. Fascinating insights being shared in a very disruptive area. Why did you decide to go the ICO route rather than raising traditional funding? What excited you about it? Please share your insights. Um, well, again, I think it's an opportunity to bypass those regular gatekeepers. So you don't have to try to network and connect with those you know, VCs and angel investors. And you don't have to because you actually, it, you know, it takes not, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. You always have to, you know, you work on presentations. You you send presentations. You send one pages. You send documentations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we, instead, we decided it probably would be more productive for us to actually focus on an ICO. And we believe also our projects are kind of you know tailor made for this kind of um, fundraising. Um, we have the technology, we have the business model, we have the team, and we believe we have the expertise to be successful. 
and uh, you know hopefully it's going to work for us but, but at the same time it doesn't mean that you know if the right opportunity from an angel investor or from a VC comes along that we would uh, turn them down but but at this point that's what we're focused on so Michael I'm going to jump right in here because I know millions of entrepreneurs are going to find me to ask me this question if you had to tell our entrepreneurs in a as quick a summary as possible if they wanted to do an ICO could you tell us the four to five steps that you feel our startup should be following if they wanted to successfully undertake this ICO mission? Um, well, sure. Again, uh, you, in most cases, you have to have a you know, blockchain technology built in into your startup. Um, you have to have a business model that is going to be understandable to the general public because, again, you are raising money not from professional investors you're raising money from you know regular people um you have to have a solid team and you and once you know once you have all those things in place then usually the next step would be to write a white paper uh that's essential then this white paper is going to be reviewed by your peers by other people in the blockchain community and, and obviously by your potential investors so you're White paper, I think, is probably the most important factor in your ICO process. It's better be good. And then, obviously, you know, the next step is the PR part, because if people don't know about your project, if they don't know about your ICO, you know, then they're not going to invest. Uh, just, you know, actually recently I've, you know, I've spoken to somebody, to an ICO advisor, and the guy said to me, you know, uh, give me a really dumb project with a lot of money for pr i'll take it any day over a really good you know technical project uh, but where people don't have enough money for you know to promote themselves and i think unfortunately it is true sometimes and so it's so you have to either have you know, some resources for the pr part or you have to find some kind of innovative ways of promoting yourself with you know, minimum resources Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael. Fascinating insights, everybody. You'll be very excited to know. We have a, a session next Sunday specifically on ICOs. So I think Michael's wet your appetite. It's definitely one not to be missed. We have some of the world's top thought leaders on ICOs. So we are definitely going to be coming back to this and we're going to get down and dirty on it. Now, I know something that's very important for many of our startups, especially our startups in the science space, is the idea of patents. Once again, I'm the first to admit I've made a thousand mistakes when it comes to patents. And Monica is going to open this one up. I know um, globally there are different perspectives in terms of patents, in terms of registering your PCT. I know um, for a lot of businesses, the most powerful thing you have in terms of building your business is your intellectual property. So I'm going to hand it over to Monica and then of course our other panelists will share their global perspectives. Monica, please share your, your thoughts in terms of the do's and don'ts of patents and please be 100% honest because we do have a global community listening. Yeah, so I really wanted to take this from the perspective of one of the things that I have seen to be a huge barrier um, for startups is really not protecting their intellectual property or not doing a thorough research to really understand the competitive market. So one of the things that I really want to say is that if you don't have legal counsel as part of your advisory board to also have someone who really understands this process, it is not um, as straightforward as you would like for it to be. Um, so whether you're here in the United States or whether you are in India, China, wherever, you really want someone who really understands this process because I've seen, um, unfortunately, a lot of people get sidetracked um, through here where they thought they had um, a patent pending and they really didn't. So just um, a very high level, please just make sure that you have um, someone who can advise you and walk you through this process. It can save you a lot of heartache. So Monica, I'm going to jump right in and it's been very interesting because I've seen some extraordinary young entrepreneurs. Um, I'm thinking of one team in particular. They are young, they're ambitious, they're brilliant scientists. Um, they registered um, their patent in South Africa and now they've come to the US and as I say, having walked this journey, I, my heart goes out to them. If you are advising entrepreneurs from around the globe who are looking to come and build their businesses in the US, register them as Delaware companies and then Monica, what are the most important things for entrepreneurs to know? Because I know often the words PCT, um, 
registering your patent in the US, Canada, yeah. Japan versus the emerging markets. I know it's a, a very scary place for a lot of entrepreneurs. I know we have a limited time. What are the most important things you would like to share with our community that you feel are critical when it comes to this? Yeah, so from the beginning, before you start investing a ton of your money into your startup, really understand the process, understand, you know, how much of a barrier is going to be for you to really um, register your patent um, globally and not just not just um, where you are, um, where you're operating um, from a incubator incubator perspective. So I would say seek the seek the legal advice early instead of later when you've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but just make sure that you're able to see that this can scale beyond um, your the country where you're founding the business in and that it's not um, going to be too late by the time that you're ready to go ahead and and get this to the market and you unfortunately you don't have the proper paperwork um, abroad. So um, I wish we could have another session on this. I want to be respectful of the time, but there's there's a lot of ins and outs here um, that I, I really stress to the community to um, please seek the legal advice up front instead of when you've already gone well down the path. I hope everybody had a pen and paper out. What Monica just said is beyond important. Monica, we definitely will be inviting you back for a, a session specifically on this topic. Thank you for sharing. Christoph, please go for it. And then I know our time is limited. We've got two questions we definitely want to get through. Graham, we also want to hear your insights on this question. So, Christoph, I hope we can hear you. Let's do this. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Go for it, Christoph. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, on, pay on intellectual property, uh, I'm... Uh, I've got a number of inventions that I've done in over my years, so I'm quite familiar with this. In the pro it's, it's very important to realize that your intellectual property is one of the most important valuable assets of your company. Your investors uh, will be needing that intellectual property to increase the valuation of your business. One of the things about uh, doing intellectual property when you first start, sometimes start off uh, by getting, if you're developing a product, a design registration. Design registration is much simpler to do, uh, but you basically manage to get yourself intellectual property straight away. So uh, yes, do seek the right partner for to help you in terms of legal counsel uh, to develop your, uh, to help you with the intellectual property process, but be careful, don't go spending too much straight away. Uh, you do it step by step and do your searches um, and uh, this is this is very important and when you are doing your searches you will find you may even find that you're actually trading on somebody else's toe but this will could probably help you to develop even something better and get over that so it's uh, it's a process that you you need to manage uh, on a step by step way and the cost can escalate if you if you're not careful so uh, that's the sort of advice i can give on the intellectual property thank you christoph and we're definitely going to have a session on this because once again like monica you touched on some very very important elements in terms of if you do touch on someone else's ip how do you get around it successfully so we definitely will be talking to you again about that graham as quickly as possible please share your insights in terms of patents and then we're going to jump into my favorite part of the session so get ready everybody graham please go for it Thanks. Uh, yeah, that was really insightful, actually. Um, I just wanted to add for the for the startups out there that that don't have something which is um, patentable or you can get an IP for. So I work with a lot of software companies that actually they can't really get an IP. You know, what you need to do in that situation is is basically create your own kind of barriers to entry. So uh, think about how you can protect yourself against other against competition in that instance. So having a really strong team, having having the best partnerships. Um, having secured and securing that big customer, all those types of things that help you kind of build those barriers around you from a competition point of view. Thank you, Graham. Again, they are very good at what they do, our experts today. I look forward to having them all back. Now, my favorite part of today's session, um, what excites our VIP guests in 2017 and what industries are ripe for disruption? We're gonna fly through our panel before we ask our experts for their tweak piece of advice. So, Graham, given the fact that you are on the hot seat right now, Graham, what excites you in 2017 and what industries are ripe for disruption? Go for it. Um, I think the industry that's, that's ripe for disruption right now is uh, healthcare.
is videos um, and and the kind of the rise of cryptocurrencies over the next twelve months or so. I think that's good. It's going to be a really exciting next twelve to eighteen months. Awesome, uh, awesome, awesome! Thank you. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Monica, you go next. Um, the meal kit industry is one that I think is ripe for disruption, um, ripe, for, ripe for disruption. I think there's a lot of great things coming there with um, all the different players that are popping up. And then what excites me um, in 2017 is really the increased focus on girls in tech, female entrepreneurs and minority entrepreneurs, um, giving more people a seat at the table. Love it, love it, love it. Some fantastic insights and ones no one's ever shared before. So thank you very much there. Josh, please tell us what excites you in 2017, what industries are ripe for disruption. I think we may have lost Josh, everybody. Just bear with us. Michael, what excites you in 2017, what industries are ripe for disruption? Well, again, I'm going to be biased here. I will also say healthcare. Healthcare is a huge industry in the U.S. The, ex the, the expenditure of healthcare, it's about $3.5 trillion annually, and $1 trillion of this is wasted. So I think it's going to be disrupted within the next couple of years. And what excites me, again, I'm going to be biased. I think this uh, latest hype, ICO hype, you know, is this wave that hopefully we can ride. I, I think it's, you know, it's very exciting. Uh, fantastic insights being shared. Christoph, as quickly as you can, what excites you in 2017 when industries are ripe for disruption? Absolutely, health tech. Uh, that's my favorite. That's what I'm in. Health tech and clean tech. We live in a world which is in uh, uh, serious need of repair. So I see that these two industries are being very exciting and um, raring to go. There will be nonstop uh, disruption on that in those industries. Awesome, thank you. And we are going to find uh, Josh. I know he will be back, He's just having some connectivity issues. In the meantime, I'm going to ask our VIPs to prepare their tweet piece of advice that we can all go ahead and apply to our businesses so we can all become supremely successful entrepreneurs and change the world in the process. In the meantime, I'm just going to run through a few important things you all need to know. Thanks to everyone for this truly amazing session. Just to keep you posted on our upcoming session with the world's best, joining us once again as panelists. Our next fireside chat is one you definitely don't want on August 30th, uh, this coming Wednesday, accelerators and incubators, do they make it really make a difference to the success of your startup? And we have the founders of some of the most successful accelerators in the world joining us this Wednesday. So you don't want to miss out. If you want to apply to some of these accelerators, you definitely want to join us. Next week, Wednesday, we are getting down and dirty with ICOs. Is it an opportunity for you as entrepreneurs to raise funding for your businesses? Or as Michael said, is it a bubble about to burst? And then on September 6th, we have a very interesting one. Is talent overrated? Can being mentally tough really be overcome anything? And then on the 10th of September, hiring for a perfect culture fit. What do you need to know? Uh, remember to keep us up to date on all your progress. We love hearing from you. Our VIPs love hearing from you. So now we're going to jump through this next section as quickly as possible. We have one minute. We're going to ask Monica, please share your tweet piece of advice. Wake up each day and do what excites you and not what everyone else expects of you. Love it, love it, love it. Michael, your tweet piece of advice. Um, just be persistent. You'll have reasons to give up every day. You have to be persistent. Love it, love it, love it. Christoph, your tweet piece of advice. It's been stolen from me, so I'll use another one. Uh, just uh, keep learning, keep learning. And uh, applying that learning to what you uh, into your business. Fantastic piece of advice. I think one we should all be paying great attention to. Graham, your tweet piece of advice. Um, be adaptable, never give up, and perseverance pays off. Love it, love it, love it. We've made sure to cover all our panelists with their tweet piece of advice. Please don't forget if you enjoyed our session today, um, share the invitations with your community of entrepreneurs. We are trying to reach 100 countries, and we know with your help we can make this happen. I know we have hundreds of WhatsApp groups around the globe, with thousands of entrepreneurs connecting and doing amazing stuff. Thank you to all of you. My tweet piece of advice, be grateful for everything you have. We are very, very fortunate to be entrepreneurs, to be building our dreams, and to be learning from such extraordinary people on a Sunday. This is a privilege, and we should never take it for granted. Thanks again to everyone for a truly, truly amazing session. We want you to have an amazing heat week and as our VIPs would tell you never ever ever give up 
Uh, I'm going to say bye to you on behalf of Josh. I'm sure he will return at some point with better connectivity, but we love having all of you join us. On the count of three, we're going to ask all our VIPs to shout bye. So VIPs, one, two, three. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, bye. bye everyone. Bye. bye. <laughs>